Uh, now let's move to our next invited speaker, uh, David Held. Um, so uh, let me let me introduce um, David. So um, um, David is uh, assistant professor at uh, Carnegie Mellon University, uh, the Robotics Institute, and he's also director of the Air PAD Lab, uh, which stands for Robot Perceiving uh, and Doing. And uh, prior to that, David was a postdoc uh, at UC Berkeley, and he also completed his uh, PhD at uh, Stanford University. And before that, he finished his bachelor and master's degree at uh, MIT. So David is also a recipient of a Google Faculty Research Award uh, in 17 and um, NSF Career Award in uh, 2021. Uh, David's research focuses on perceptual robot learning, um, such as developing new methods that, uh, that apply the intersection of uh, robot perception and planning for robots to learn to interact with novel perceptually challenging and formal objects. Uh, David has applied this ideas also to robot manipulation and autonomous driving. And uh, actually, one of the core questions of this workshop is also how to leverage self-supervision for topics uh, that we are discussing in this workshop today, uh, because collecting uh, densely labeled sequential data is uh, very expensive. And this is also why we are super excited to hear more about uh, David's recent work on self-supervised learning for, for autonomous driving. Okay, uh, great. Um, so thank you very much for the kind introduction and for inviting me to speak at this workshop. And today I'm uh, going to talk about my work on self-supervised 3D perception for autonomous driving. So if we think about why is autonomous driving difficult, um, I like to think about it in terms of the long tail of autonomous driving. So when most people first think about autonomous driving, you might think about a scenario like this where you're on a highway, and your goal is just to stay in your lane and avoid crashing into the car in front of you. Um, fortunately, that's not such a difficult problem. There's been many companies that have uh, managed to build a pretty robust system for this kind of scenario. More difficult is this kind of scenario where you have a busy intersection, where you have uh, people, cars, and bicyclists that are moving in lots of different directions, and you need to be able to detect and track all of the objects in the scene to make sure that you can plan a trajectory to not crash into any of these objects. Then uh, once you start to collect lots of autonomous driving data or driving data, you start to see some of the really weird things on the road. So some of the things that I'm showing in these uh, images on the right are uh, here's a, a chair that's flying off of the back of a truck. Um, here's a dog that's running in the middle of the road. Um, here's a uh, actually a reflective, um, highly reflective truck um, that creates kind of a, an illusion of another vehicle. Um, and here's some cones that are tipped over uh, and placed in the middle of the road. Um, you can find many more examples of weird things on the road if you uh, Google around or if you um, collect enough data. So how do we actually handle the weird things? So the traditional approach to uh, machine learning is supervised learning where you collect a large labeled data set. You have humans annotate all the things in that data set. Um, for autonomous driving, that would mean uh, where all the objects are and how they're moving um, at each um, point in time. Then given all of that data, you feed it to your favorite machine learning algorithm, which outputs predictions of uh, where these objects are and how they're moving. Uh, now, the problem is that if you need to be able to capture the long tail, how do you ensure that the person has actually labeled all of the weird cases? If they are going through and labeling all of the examples, they might not get to all of the unusual things that, uh, that we see. So essentially, the, the issue that I'm pointing out here is that it's actually easier to collect large scale data for autonomous driving than it is to label it, because collecting data just requires putting some sensors on a fleet of vehicles and driving around, which people are all are already doing all the time anyway, um, labeling data is, uh, is, is much more difficult and time consuming. So can we skip over the labeling phase using self-supervised methods to directly learn from large unlabeled image data sets? So my group uh, at CMU has uh, developed a number of methods along these lines for self-supervised learning for autonomous driving. Um, so uh, we've applied this idea of self-supervised learning to be able to learn uh, scene 
3D scene flow, 3D data association, uh, free space forecasting. This one was joint work with uh, Deva Ramanan, who will be uh, speaking later today. Um, 3D object detection and point cloud completion. So uh, in today's workshop, I'm going to focus on the first and last ones, which uh, the first one was uh, an oral presentation at CVPR 2020. And the last one was recently accepted for an oral presentation uh, at BMVC. Um, and I'll talk about both of these as well as their uh, relation to the theme of the workshop, which is tracking. So I'll start with my work on self-supervised scene flow. And this is work that was done by uh, my students, uh, Himagi and Brian. So a traditional tracking pipeline, which uh, might involve taking as input 3D data of the world and then uh, segmenting and tracking, uh, segmenting the objects in the scene. Then for each uh, segmented or detected object, you can track uh, that object to estimate a velocity of where that object is moving. And then you, you, you can try to use that velocity to predict the future motion of each object. Now, the problem comes in, what if there are uh, segmentation or detection errors? In this case, these uh, pedestrians are near each other are all segmented together into a single big segment, which means that they will get assigned a single velocity. Um, and this is a problem if one of the pedestrians is moving differently from the rest of them, uh, that will not be detected, which will lead to errors in uh, the future motion prediction as well. So essentially, um, the problem here is that we are reasoning at the object level, which can uh, lead to errors uh, downstream in terms of motion prediction. So um, I believe that in parallel to this pipeline, we should have a separate pipeline that does not reason at the object level, but reasons, reasons more at the point level. So uh, instead of estimating the velocity for each object, we should estimate the velocity for each point. And that if we have these two systems in parallel, then we can have a more robust system overall that can ensure that we don't crash into anything, even if we don't know how to detect it. So um, uh, Relay worked prior to ours as uh, Flownet 3D, which uh, is a uh, great groundbreaking work in this direction of uh, deep learning for 3D scene flow. Um, it uh, significantly outperformed previous approaches, um, but it required point level motion level la labels in order to train. And so what we wanted to look into is can we um, build on this and train us the same architecture, but with only self-supervised losses instead of requiring labeled scene flow data. So our approach to doing this is as follows. So given uh, two, uh, 3D scenes. Here I'm just showing a single object, but, but you can uh, think in your mind these are actually two entire 3D scenes. We pass them both through our network and output a prediction of uh, how each point in the first frame, uh, where each point has moved to in the second frame. And uh, we train that with a nearest neighbor loss. Then we take actually our predictions and we try to align it uh, uh, sorry, we take a, uh, our predictions, we use that to sort of warp the input point cloud, and now we input that warp point cloud into our network and try to align it back to the original scene. So uh, that we call uh, reverse flow. Um, it's using the same network, but just uh, going uh, backwards in time back to the original frame, and we use a cycle consistency loss to train that. So uh, going to a little bit more detail of why do we need both of these losses. Um, so remember, we don't have any supervised losses here. So given two frames, we might take a point in the first frame and try to predict where it's moved to in the second frame. And we might get this wrong. Ideally, in the, uh, we would know the ground truth and have a loss of the distance between the predicted location and the ground truth. But in the self-supervised world, we don't have that. So instead, we just take the nearest neighbor of the prediction, and we have a loss that the point should at least be close to some nearest neighbor in the second frame. Um, the nearest neighbor is not necessarily the corresponding point, so this is not necessarily uh, the perfect loss, but it's, we're kind of trying to make do with what we have, um, given that we don't have any labels. So 
that's uh, the uh, nearest neighbor loss. And um, besides the fact that you don't know the grudge with correspondences, another um, potential downside of just using nearest neighbor is that all the points in the first frame might map to a single point in the other in the second frame, and that would also minimize the nearest neighbor loss. So uh, in addition to uh, nearest neighbor loss, we also use a cycle consistency loss, which says that uh, the warped points um, based on our predictions, when we map them back to try to register them back to the original frame should uh, correspond back to exactly where they started. So this forms a cycle. Um, so here you can see uh, where this point ended up and it's not where it started. So we apply a cycle loss um, that should end up exactly back where it started. Um, okay, and so this loss also has a potential degenerate solution, which is for the points not to move at all, and then they'll end up exactly back where they started if we predict that they don't move. And so this is uh, not correct, but it's it, it would minimize the cycle loss if that were the only loss that we had. So um, so now if we have combined both of these losses, they both have different degenerate solutions, but by combining both of them, the network uh, ideally learns to do the right thing and actually map each point to uh, its corresponding point in the other frame. So that, um, that all sounds pretty nice. Um, it works reasonably well, but there's one additional issue that we have to uh, think about to get this to work, which is uh, that remember what we're doing is we output um, predictions from the network and then we warp the input based on those predictions and feed the warped input back into the network um, to go uh, make a prediction backward in time. So when the network is done training, these warped predictions look really nice. But at the beginning of training, uh, we get actually very noisy predictions. And if you try to input those back into the network, you kind of get a garbage in, garbage out scenario. And the output doesn't necessarily, the network doesn't necessarily know what to do with this. So in order to um, so in order to mitigate the scenario, we use what's called um, anchoring, where we take our warped predictions and we find the nearest neighbor um, to them in um, fr from them in, in the uh, corresponding uh, point cloud of the second frame. And then we move each point uh, some fraction of the way towards their corresponding point. So now we can still kind of trace the movement of each point and do apply a cycle consistency loss, um, but the points are now um, grounded a little bit more in reality and the input to our network in the reverse direction is going to look a little bit more reasonable even at the very beginning of training when the, the network is, is untrained. So now we input this anchored prediction into the point into the network um, for the reverse direction of time um, instead of the raw outputs of the network at the beginning. Okay, um, in terms of network architectures, um, we didn't focus on that too much in this work. So we actually just use the same architecture as Flowna3D um, so that we can directly compare the Flowna3D's performance with uh, their supervised approach versus our self-supervised training. Um, probably newer architectures will lead to even better performance but um, but the architecture uh, wasn't the, the focus on this of this work. So um, previous work uh, such as uh, Flona 3D applied the following uh, approach to training, which is they started by uh, pre-training a large synthetic data set. They used Flying Things 3D, um, which is a synthetic data set with um, kind of objects flying through space um, and. Uh, then they uh, did supervised fine tuning on a small amount of uh, labeled real world data. So it's hard to label real world data for this task um, because it requires kind of labeling the motion of each 3D point. Um, so they only um, they only did re training real world training on a very small labeled real world data set. So. Um, in our approach, we are able to add in the middle of this procedure, self-supervised fine tuning 
on a large real world unlabeled data set. And then we follow that with supervised fine tuning on the small real world data set. So uh, we're kind of adding in the mail here a large amount of real world data that we can now train on because we have self supervised losses. So compared to previous uh, approaches, so this is the, the performance that you get um, if you only train on synthetic data. If you add the small amount of real world data that's labeled, you get a 6% boost in performance. And then if you add a large amount of unlabeled uh, real world data with our self supervised losses, you get another 15% uh, boost in performance. So uh, we were quite encouraged by those results. Um, uh, in terms of how much each of the different components of our system contributes, so here you can see again the performance of our full system. If we remove the nearest neighbor loss, you get a 30% drop in performance. If you move the cycle loss, you get a 15% drop. And if you remove the anchoring procedure that we discussed at the end, you get a 23% drop. So all of these uh, losses and uh, components are important for our system. Um, so I see there is a question in the chat. Um, can you avoid using synthetic data pre-training completely? Um, yeah, so um, in theory, you could, um, I guess, uh, probably with enough unlabeled data um, that that would work, but uh, we we found that it's better to um, to to initialize our network with synthetic pre-training. It just gives our network a slightly better initialization um, for the self-supervised part. Um, yeah, great question. Um, OK, and here's um, some qualitative results of a cyclist that's moving by. And you can see uh, the uh, direction of the flow vectors from the red points to the green points showing that we're uh, correctly estimating the motion of the cyclist. So uh, in conclusion, um, we have a method for self-supervised uh, training for 3D scene flow that allows us to leverage large unlabeled data sets. And this allows us to exceed the performance of supervised training from uh, smaller labeled data sets. So, uh, so that was the work on self-supervised scene flow. Um, and uh, next, I'll talk about my work on self-supervised point count completion via in-painting. This was work, again, by, done by my students, um, Hamangi and Brian. Um, Hamangi, by the way, uh, will be applying for PhD programs uh, this year. So if you're looking for a great PhD student, um, you should look out for her application. Um, and Brian will be uh, looking for postdocs. So um, keep your eye out for both of them. Um, okay, so what makes point cloud tracking hard? Um, well, I, I believe that there's essentially two factors. So if you have um, essentially the, uh, the the idea of point cloud tracking is you have uh, point clouds you, you've observed at two different uh, points in time and you want to align them to each other. Um, there's uh, essentially two things in my mind that make it hard. One is the large search space. Potentially you're searching over um, the 60 post space to try to align these point clouds and you need to um, to find a good alignment in this space. Um, or if they're you know well initialized, then that can reduce the search space that you might need. Um, so finding a good initialization is is another aspect of the problem. Um, or uh, another um, thing that makes it difficult is the fact that you have occlusions or self occlusions. So if you're trying to align to uh, point clouds, but they actually contain different points because maybe the viewpoint has changed or the object has moved, and now you're aligning say the back of a car that you saw in one frame to the front of a car that you see in another frame, that's not going to be very difficult. So the fact that you only have partial point clouds is one of the things that makes tracking hard. So uh, in this work, we're going to be focusing on uh, this aspect, aspect of the problem that you only have partial point clouds. So our previous work um, that, that we've done uh, in collaboration with um, Marshall Hebert was uh, on uh, supervised uh, shape completion. So given some uh, partial point clouds, can we learn how to complete them uh, and estimate the full 3D shape? And um, we were able to do that 
Um, and here you can see um, some of our results on uh, the Kitty data set. So here's some objects that we've uh, did that, um, sorry, these are some, some vehicles and these are the partial point clouds. Our method is able to learn to complete the full 3D shape of these vehicles. And um, here you can see kind of a video of this happening as we go by and we're able to um, complete all of these shapes. Our method runs in a little over a millisecond per object, so it's fast enough for real-time use. Um, and this is important for tracking because if you can complete the three shapes, you can better align the point clouds of that object over time, um, which allows you to better estimate its velocity. So on the left here, you can see this is just one example of uh, partial point clouds that we're trying to align, and the alignment is not correct. There's a large rotational and translational error, but if you instead try to align the completed point clouds um, using the same alignment method, then you get uh, much reduced errors. Um, and here you can see over this entire data set, um, the uh, rotational errors on the left, translational errors on the right. Red shows the errors if you try to align just the partial point clouds, and the blue bars show the improvement that you get if you try to align instead the completed point clouds. So you can see that there is, um, in most cases, a large improvement for aligning the completed point clouds instead of the partial point clouds. So um, so that previous work was uh, very very motivating for us that um, completing point clouds gives large benefit. But one thing that one limitation of this past work is that it was supervised. So essentially you need ground truth of the full 3D shape to supervise the completion. And the ground truth in that case came from a synthetic data set, which is ShapeNet. So some statistics about ShapeNet, um, it's uh, very uh, well-known data set. Many of you probably are familiar with it. It contains over 3 million 3D CAD models, um, 200, over 200,000 of which are labeled with object categories. So it, uh, it includes, for example, many um, cars, motorcycles, and bicycles, So uh, among other categories. So here you can see some examples of some of the categories in ShapeNet um, relevant to uh, autonomous driving. Um, there's uh, here's some examples of motorcycles. Here's some um, examples of some of the cars in the data set. And here's two pictures of bicycles from this data set. Um, and so that's a pretty decent data set, but we still wanted to know, can we learn data, uh, learn shape completion directly from data in the real world? And so this means um, more diverse, uh, we, we want to train with more diversity within object category, if you can learn from real data, we can train with more diverse object categories, deformable objects, and realistic sensor noise. Um, Alicia, just a time check. I believe I have three more minutes. Is that correct? Um, yeah, but we, we can go a bit over because we, uh, okay. we have a break after that. Okay, okay great. So, um, okay, so can we learn just from partial point clouds without ever seeing the full completed point cloud? Um, and so, um, so some pre-processing that we do for this is we first align the points into some canonical frame. Um, this can be done either if with from the orientation of the bounding box, if we use a detector, or using our previous work, ITNet, which is weekly supervised pose estimation. Um, and the goal is just to align all the points. It doesn't really matter how, what frame they're aligned to. Um, so we apply each of these methods for different data sets. Um, and the basic idea that we use is that in painting, so given an input um, we try to, uh, that has a missing region, we try to fill in a miss missing region. This has done, been done before with images, um, but our question is, can we apply this idea to point clouds? And in our case, we actually don't even ob ever observe the full, um, the full point cloud. So how do we do that? So the basic idea is given some input partial point cloud, we're going to drop out more of the points, and then we're going to try to complete the full point cloud. Um, and, um, and the trick here is we know, we can sort of see what parts of the input were originally missing. Um, and if our network tries to fill in those regions, then we don't penalize it for doing so. Um, we just let the network do whatever it wants in the regions where there was originally no points. But then there's the other regions where we dropped out points and the network tries to fill it in 
And those are the regions where we actually know the ground truth because we dropped out the points in those regions. We know how they were supposed to be filled in. And so we apply the laws only to those regions. Um, and we do this for many different examples. We drop out different points um, and fill it in. And so essentially the network doesn't really know which points were removed and which points um, were just missing in the input. So it essentially learns how to um, complete the full point cloud. So um, I'll skip past um, our architecture, but you can see it uh, in the paper. Um, for losses, we have two losses is impending loss, and we also use the multi view consistency loss, which was used in prior work. So, um, so yeah, so the main idea, though, is just uh, the main novel thing that we introduced is this idea of in painting. Um, we evaluate on both the shape net data set, which is has synthetic, synthetic data set, but has ground truth, and the semantic kitty data set, which we um, sort of create a pseudo ground truth by aggregating points from parked vehicles. And both of these evaluations were done in prior, previous work. Um, so um, yeah, there's a question about, do we uh, force it to have the exact ground truth location? Um, we do, uh, we train over a large data set. So it kind of learns um, that there's some uh, leeway there, I guess. Um, but, but in the loss, we, we force it to the exact points. So here's some examples of our completions um, compared to uh, the ground truth. And uh, you can also compare this to prior work, um, which gives uh, noisier completions. Um, here's another example of our completions compared to the ground truth. And if we don't apply in painting, then uh, the results are clearly much worse. Um, in terms of uh, quantitative metrics, we outperform uh, uh, the baselines on semantic kitty. So ours is shown in yellow. Um, we introduced a new, very simple baseline shown in red, where we just densify the input. Um, that outperforms some of the prior work, actually, um, but uh, doesn't outperform our method. Um, and then here's uh, another example on, um, uh, sorry, just another metric on the ShapeNet data set. Um, here you can, um, sorry, actually just in interest of time, I'll kind of move, move more quickly, um, but uh, just to kind of remind you, so here's uh, completions on Semantic Kitty, and the reason we're doing this is to try to improve tracking, which we didn't actually evaluate in this paper, but you know, based on the previous results for tracking, um, that, that completion helps with tracking, we would expect um, hopefully similar improvements for our self-supervised completion approach. So, um, right, so to summarize this part, we're learning to in-paint 3D point clouds and thereby learn how to complete them only um, from training and from real world data that has just partial point clouds during training. Um, and so these were the two different papers that I talked about today, so supervised scene flow and self-supervised point cloud completion. And hopefully with more self-supervised training, we'll be able to learn how to handle the long tail of autonomous driving. So. Um, I'll end here and uh, take any remaining questions. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, it looks like there's one question in the chat. Um, how do you decide which points to artificially skip for the inpainting task? Um, so we actually just divide up the point cloud into uh, eight octants, and then we um, check which octants are full of points, and then we we drop out um, one of the octants that, that has points in them. So it's it's kind of an arbitrary um, procedure. There's probably other ways that you can do it, but um, that you know that relatively simple approach uh, we found to be good enough for for us. Um, yeah, at, at this at this stage, I would uh, like to to thank uh, David for uh, for this very uh, very interesting and very re relevant to this workshop talk. Um, so actually, we we still I think we still have some time for questions because uh, we have some time until the next session starts. So I, if that's okay with you, David, I would encourage uh, encourage participants to ask more questions. Um, so, if there are no questions from uh, from the uh, workshop participants, uh, um, I would I would have one. So, I, I found this um, 
um, I find this idea uh, very interesting that um, um, when, when you motivated um, LiDAR SYNFLOW, you were um, um, you were pointing out a bit to the fact that maybe we don't really need um, to be aware of uh, instances for uh, for a higher level or for, for down, downstream tasks such as navigation, right? So do, do you think that we that, that we could um, that we could totally get away with uh, this kind of approach. So do forecasting based on estimated synflow and uh, and uh, forget about object instances whatsoever because synflow is class agnostic, right? So it's agnostic to semantics. Yeah, I, I don't think so actually. Um, right, so I sort of was uh, taking a little bit, um, presenting kind of just the opposite uh, extreme on a spectrum, but I really, I think we really need both. Um, and one case where you need semantics is when you're thinking about traffic laws. Um, traffic laws talk about, you know, who has the right of way in different scenarios. Um, and, um, you know, you you need to think about semantics to figure out the fact that um, this this thing here um, is is an object that has the right of way compared to compared to you. Um, if, let's say it's a vehicle that arrived at a traffic light or a, um, a four-way stop before you, um, or also just thinking about kind of preferences. So if there's, um, you know, or uh, or anticipating what might happen in the future. So let's say there's a pedestrian that's standing still um, near a crosswalk. So there's no motion of this pedestrian, but there might be in the future, right? And so knowing that it's a pedestrian, um, even if there's no motion can help you anticipate future motion. Um, and so, so there, there's definitely cases in which um, semantics is important and reasoning about um, object instances can be important. So I more want to advocate for multiple systems in parallel, um, one that's maybe a higher level reasoning, that reasons about instances and semantics, but might have errors if the detection or semantic reasoning is wrong, and then a lower level um, reasoning that's maybe more robust to those kinds of mistakes that reasons more at the point level um, instead of the instance level. Um, so I think they're both gonna be important for robust autonomous driving in the real world. Mm. Um, yeah. Um, does that answer your question? Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. I, I, I totally agree with that. Yeah. Um, thanks. And there was a, a question, there's a question actually in the chat about self-supervised object detection. Um, so, um, so that's a great question. I've been thinking a lot about that. I think it's very hard. Um, we have a paper that we wrote on semi-supervised 3D detection um, with temporal graph neural networks. So the basic idea here is that if you have some initial train detector, um, you can try to run that detector on unlabeled data and you can run it on, and the, the nice part about unlabeled data is it's actually sequential. So if the detector is doing the right thing, you should see smooth tracks kind of from these detections. If you don't see smooth tracks, say if you see like an object moving and all of a sudden it disappears, the next frame it reappears, um, you probably um, did something wrong. And so this idea has been actually applied before um, in um, 2D detection, but um, it hasn't been applied to our knowledge in 3D detection. So we, um, we, we use the graph neural network to reason about these temporal sequences and to try to correct um, misdetections or false positive detections. Um, and so, uh, and then you can use those corrections to retrain your initial detector. So it kind of improves over time. Um, we found that, that that was the case and it did improve over time. Um, I think, uh, you know, there's there's other ways people might do 3D detection of um, trying to just cluster together um, moving points and say if something moves together, um, it's probably an object. So there's a lot of ideas from the like early literature on uh, gestalt, gestalt reasoning um, for segmentation that we can now maybe apply for self-supervised learning. Um, so, um, yeah, I think in theory, um, these kinds of things um, are possible. Um, I think it requires a very large scale of data to train on in order to kind of distinguish 
the real patterns from the noise. Um, because, you know, if you actually have real 3D scene, there's lots of um, occlusions, lots of things moving in and out of the scene. Um, and, and kind of distinguishing that from like a, a real moving object um, can sometimes be difficult. So, uh, so yeah, I think that in theory it should be possible, um, but, but yeah, more work is, is needed to get there. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, sharing your insights. And um, we, are, we are really, really happy we could, uh, we could host your talks here today. Yeah, thanks for the invite.